Welcome to another episode of Lessons in Humanities. Today we're going to discuss the market revolution in the United States. We will talk about when the United States became a more capitalist society and how it grew economically and how that shifted gender roles and uh, the different positions of people in society. So if you're interested, please stick around. All right, so welcome to our next edition. I uh, hope you're enjoying this series. I'm going to go through all of American history back from 1492 with Christopher Columbus to 2021 by the time I finish this. So uh, I hope you enjoy. If you have any suggestions, please write them below. And also, if you like this PowerPoint presentation or other lesson materials, I have a link below. And I also have some free materials that you might enjoy, like a timeline and different things like that. So uh, let's get started. So here's a timeline. <clears throat> this is the, the fourth timeline in this series that I'm doing, and it's easier to put these things into to chunks than remember all these little dates, which is kind of impossible. But this is from 1800 to 1842. And this is when the United States really grew. It really moved to the West, you know, this idea of manifest destiny. And right now, uh, last week we talked about the War of 1812, and now we're going to kind of... Uh, go over a longer period, basically the whole period here, 1800 to 1848, with the market revolution. So it didn't happen overnight. It took some time uh, for the for the country to, to change its economic ways. And, uh, and that's going to be some positive influences. It's going to be very good for the United States, but there's also going to obviously be some bad things that happen too as well. But here's the timeline, 1800s, that's the revolution of 1800 when uh, Jefferson became president. It was very contested election similar to the election of 2020 and it's going to end with the mexican-american war when the united states gains all the territory all the way to the pacific ocean so it's a very important time period in american history now the presidents usually with my my lessons if you've been watching them you'll notice there'll just be one or two or maybe three presidents this is going to encompass a lot of different presidents right so uh um, all of you know from from James Madison or even before a little bit all the way up to Zachary Zachary Taylor. But yeah, this is the market revolution. Uh, the United States is moving more and more west, right? And in the north, they're starting to abolish more and more slavery, but in the south, it's becoming more and more of a necessity. But there's going to be some inventions that's going to facilitate the new economic model of the United States and new technologies and new developments and new ways to transport or to, to move around the country or to communicate. And that's going to have a great effect on what the United States would become and in, has effects in the United States today. But this is the market revolution kind of um, goes hand in hand with the Industrial Revolution, right? The Industrial Revolution actually started before the American Revolution in England, Manchester, and it lasted to around the 1840s, right? And that's going to affect the United States. There's going to be a lot of innovations that were originated in Britain, but they were um, stolen by the Americans. And I think that there's an interesting comparison here is to right now, you have a great power, the United States, and another great power, China, being accused of stealing technology or innovations from the United States. So we see history repeating itself here. But the increased industrialization was a major portion of the market revolution, um, so which was that was a, which was a result of the industrial revolution. So it kind of goes goes hand in hand. But in American history, historians like to call this period in the United States the market revolution, and, and revolution just means change, right? You know, the the revolution of eighteen hundred didn't include war; it, it meant change from one party to the to the next. Same with the Industrial Revolution, which happened over a longer period of time, or the Market Revolution. Now, the early 1800s, uh, the economic there was a lot of economic de development. And when I say early 1800s, you know, I mean really from 1800 to 1820, 1830. And it really goes all the way to the Civil War, to be honest with you. But more people produce goods for sale, not consumption. So before, people would grow some crops and then eat the crops, and then grow the crops, and then eat the crops, right? <clears throat> and if they want a chair, they make a chair. 
certainly in colonial America. Um, in the late colonial America or British America, some of the wealthier people were starting to use money and they, they could afford to, to buy things and not have to produce it all themselves. But certainly poor people, especially in the West, they were subsistence, if I said that right, subsistence farmers. Sorry for my pronunciation. But this is just the idea of if I need something, I make it, right? But then uh, it turns into a, a cash, cash, as in money, society, where I could work and gain money, and I could use that money to buy things, right? So before, if I'm going to make some, you know, grow some corn, I would eat it. But now it's like, well, I'll eat it, but I'll also sell it, and I'll get some cash, and then I'll buy things. You know, before I had to make that chair, and I had to make that table, but now I can buy one, a nicer one, right? And people started to collect cash, collect money. Um, but nonetheless, improvements in transportation physically united the, 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 the United States. And this is, this is more like after the War of 1812. Because before the War of 1812, from the Revolutionary War, the American Revolution, to the War of 1812, the United States had a lot of problems with internal problems and external problems. I think we often look at the 1790s with George Washington and glamorize it. You know, George Washington is a great hero. Obviously, he was. With some faults, that has to be mentioned. Uh, but there were some strengths, without a doubt. And um, But there's a lot of problems at that time, you know, with the British attacking Americans, the French attacking Americans, uh, debt, uh, economic problems, a lot of poor people. Um and, and the United States wasn't united, and one reason it wasn't united, well, it was a new country, it wasn't sure if it was going to exist, right? And with the War of 1812, it really was uh, a threat to be overtaken by, by the British, the second American Revolution, right? The British were still very, very powerful. Beating them in 1776 was amazing, but to do it again in 1812, even though they didn't technically do it, watch my last video if you don't know what I mean, uh, but... That seemed like a great victory, even if it was just a tie, right? Um, but one reason they weren't united was being a, 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 it's a new republic, but also it was hard to get from state to state, right? Going from, from the east to the west took a long time. It was dangerous and over rocky roads. Often people went all the way to the west and they didn't come back because they didn't want to do the, the travel. Uh, but after the War of 1812... With the end of the Federalists, which was kind of the strong, big government group that wanted internal improvements in a national bank, well, the Democratic Republicans, which is the only party at this time, they kind of become like Federalists. They have the American system, and they, they want to improve internal improvements. That's just a way of saying, um, that's just a way of saying infrastructure. That's what we say today. Uh, but with roads and connecting the states, the United States would become more united, right? Uh, but then also there's just other improved technologies for farming, communication. Uh, but these great developments, which made a lot of people rich, and even even really poor people have more of a chance, uh, there was problems with class conflict because the, sep the, 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 the separation, the gap between the, the poor and the rich would, would spread. Uh, there's also child labor, which will be a problem until the Gilded Age. Uh, until the Progressive Era, really, which is in the early 1900s. And there's also increased immigration, which is good and brought some problems because that also brought a nativist sentiment. People worried about their jobs and discriminating against the Irish or the Germans. Um, there was also the increase for slavery. See, the, the American founding fathers thought slavery would slowly go away. A lot of people spoke negatively of it during the Constitutional Convention, <clears throat> but they didn't want to upset some of the, the powerful people in the South. So uh, they, didn't, they didn't abolish it during the Revolution or during the Constitutional Convention. But with this new development and in, in inventions like the cotton gin and the, 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 the textile industry and the more demand for cotton, that means there's more of a demand for slaves. slaves. The cities are growing. Uh, and also there's just changes in the roles of women in the family. Right, so before we'll talk about that. Let's we'll get to that when we get to this slide. So uh, before uh, okay, before the War of eighteen twelve, um, so exports did increase in the decades before the War of eighteen twelve. Right now, there was a lot of problems with the British and the French attacking American ships, and then there was the Embargo Act for underneath Jefferson, but. 
uh, that's going to halt uh, trade, but there is going to be an increase in, uh, in, in some exports. But the transportation between the states was very, very difficult. It was easier to export goods over the Atlantic Ocean to export them over the states. So something that could, you know, it's something, you know, a certain amount of tons that you transported from the United States to Europe was about the same price as it cost from one state to another state. So, you know, figure that out. But the War of 1812 was uh, a turning point in a sense, right? It's a small turning point because that's when the United States became more united. And then they started doing more regulations or more, not I won't say regulations, I'll say more uh, internal improvements. And that's going to unite the country. So after the War of 1812, they built new roads and canals and railroads. And the state government and federal government funded infrastructure projects. So the government is funding it. And uh, the Britain, who the United States has just fought, is going to also uh, provide capital, right, investments to build these roads. And that's going <clears> to <throat> be a part of this, of this market revolution. Now, this new economic system, as I mentioned before, it's more of a cash economy. So earlier, it was more like land. If you had land, you were rich. Now, it's more cash. Of course, owning land is, is it's an asset, and it's, it's deemed valuable at this time, but more people are looking for this, this cash, this money, because you can buy things. Uh, and this, was, this included the West, because the West, especially how difficult it was getting, it was to get there. Like in the early republic, in the coastal cities, some people were using cash and they were, um, you know, the trading uh, with other cities or it was a little bit easier because the transportation between those cities was a little bit easier. But going to the West was very, very difficult. So in the West, it was very much a, a barter system um, or, you know, trading different commodities, maybe whiskey, using whiskey or tobacco as, as a currency instead of cash. But now there's going to be more banks in the left, in, in the left, in the west, and that's going to make it av available for um, for the west to join this cash economy. But with the cash economy, there's going to be more uh, counterfeited money and corrupt dealers, right? So there's this, um, you know, there's this person they call him the confidence man, and the confidence man is somebody that looked confident; they could just wheel and deal. And they would they would be corrupt, and they would take your money or trade you with corrupt money. Um, but yeah, so this cap and the other problem though is is the capital system is susceptible to economic recessions and depressions. Back then they called them panics. So you'll see one in 1819, and you'll see one in 1837. So in these panics, uh, usually uh, sprung up by speculation, speculating in land or. Um, even uh, African slaves and different reasons, uh, these panics would ensue. And that would really, for people trying to make it in this cash economy, that would really hurt them. Uh, they wouldn't expect it or they wouldn't be ready and they would lose everything. Now, first we have the uh, transportation revolution, which was paramount to this market revolution. Uh, so travel to the West was extremely slow, few roads, and very rough and very dangerous. 1807, you have the first commercial steamboat. Steamboats could go both directions on a river, not just one. So be before, they just had to go with the current. But now they can go both ways. And that makes a big, that makes a big difference. So it's a steamboat. And then in 1825, you have the Erie Canal. So this was part of a canal boom, and it's going to happen not just in New York State, but in Ohio, Indiana, the, the old northwest. And the, the Erie Canal specifically, that linked the Great Lakes to the Hudson River. So all these resources from the west could be brought to the Erie Canal, to the Hudson River, and down the Hudson River to New York. For this reason, New York became one of the biggest or the biggest city in the United States, and it still is today. Uh, and in 1827, you have the first long-distance railroad line. It went from Maryland to Ohio. And after this, more cities would follow. They would build their own lines. Uh, and state governments paid a large amount for, these, for, these, for this production. But after the Panic of 1837, they got really hurt. So they would, they would, that would change in 1837. But the governments would, would subsidize uh, these, these major projects. 
In this picture, you see the first American-built steam locomotive. It's called the Tom Thumb. Uh, this went on the, the, the line. It was um, the line from, from Maryland to Ohio. So it was the Baltimore and Ohio line. Uh, and you can see before they were using horses. Horses would, would run these things down the railroads. Uh, then the locomotive, people didn't trust it. They thought the horses were better. And then they tried this Tom Thumb, and it worked. So that's interesting. We also have the communication revolution. So simple messages were used. They used to take weeks to go long distances. So if you remember in 1824, 50 years uh, after the after the Declaration of Independence, that's when Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died. Now, they, they both died on the same day. They were communicating in their, their later years when they were old and retired and in bad health, they would communicate with messages. These messages would take a long time to get to where it needed to go. It could take days, it could take weeks just for a simple message. Well, that's what happened with Adams and Jefferson. It took weeks or days to, to send a message from Virginia to Boston. And neither one know, knew the other one died. They both died on the same day. But this made tele, uh, the telegraph communications, they could... Uh, they could spread communication very quickly. So in 1843, Samuel Morse persuaded Congress to fund a 40-mile telegraph from Washington, D.C. to Baltimore. And after that, it would just go crazy. The telegraph would go all over the United States, and communication could be would be instant. So uh, I have a quote here from Henry David Thoreau. He says, uh, We are in great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas, but Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. We are eager to tunnel under the Atlantic and bring the old world some weeks nearer to the new, but perchance the first news that will leak through into the broad flapping of American ear will be that Princess Adelaide has the whooping cough, so kind of frivolous, unnecessary information. Now, just look at that. I mean, compare that that today when we have our mobile phones and we can get information like that about anything if there's news that happened in europe or asia or south america anywhere you instantaneously get the news um about a princess getting the whooping cough for example or something more serious about somebody uh, a terrorist attack or about a pandemic or whatnot um but Henry David Thoreau, who was very forward-thinking, but he also liked to challenge. He was kind of the civil disobedient guy, right? Uh, challenge the norms and was against slavery and against the Mexican-American War. But I think a lot of people might actually have this, this, this thought today. I mean, think about what are we using our mobile phones for? <laughs> Some, a lot of times it's good. You got to tell mom where you are or your wife or husband or friend or whatever. Or maybe you're reading the news on the subway, but a lot of times we're reading about, you know, social issues that are not that important. Uh, but nonetheless, obviously, the communication is just going to explode from the 1800s to 2020 and beyond. Who knows? I mean, we get it so instantaneously. Um, it's hard to imagine what life would be like without it. Um, so I thought this was interesting. Now, other technologies other than transportation and communication included um, tools that could be used in the, um, you know, in the on the field or in the farm. Uh, so, it was, you know, since the U.S. was turning into a cash economy, farmers in the West could use credit. They could buy things uh, using credit, and then they would grow their food and make money and pay back the credit. And if they did it s smartly, if that's a word, they could actually earn money on their, their leverage, <clears throat> on their credit. Now, some of the new technologies include the, the Cyrus McCormick Reaper. So this made uh, harvesting crops. Um, no longer had to do it by hand. So they had to reap it by hand. But now you could put it on a horse and you could reap it, no problem. And then you have the John Deere Steel Bladed Plow. plow sorry. <clears throat> and this made on a broken land that was very hard. They it'd break it up and make it more fertile. And between 1815 and 1850, there was an explosion of patents. Uh, and a patent just gives people the rights to their to their invention. 
So you can see during this market revolution, during this industrial revolution, there's lots of innovation, lots of new technology, which is going to make life better. There's also the growth of cities. So more people are going to move to the cities. Uh, in a, f a later slide, I'll talk about the immigrants. There's going to be lots of immigrants coming to the United States at this time in the, in the early 1800s, the mid-1800s. And a lot of them, especially the Irish, are going to go to the cities. Now, this city uh, is... Manhattan, it's New York City. And I just want to point out, if you look there on the, the right, you see the Brooklyn Bridge. By the time of this, uh, this is in the later 1800s, I think 1870s, this illustration. And the Brooklyn Bridge is the tallest structure in Manhattan, which it isn't anymore, obviously. <laughs> but it was, it, this is when it was the, the tallest structure in Manhattan. And uh, had just been built about the time this illustration was made. And people were so scared to cross it uh, that they had to, they sent uh, elephants across, a circus of elephants, just to give people confidence that they could cross the, the Brooklyn Bridge. But the important point here is during this market revolution, more and more people are moving to the cities. And now contrast with that uh, with today, 2020 and possibly 2021 or 2022, whenever you're watching this video. Uh, people are actually leaving the cities, but that's part to do with the pandemic. But will that continue? Cities are having some problems. So, But here in the 1800s, they're going to the cities. Uh, now, the decline of northern slavery. So um, slavery was becoming more and more abolished in more and more of the states in the north. So... Vermont was the first one in 1777. Now, Vermont wasn't even a part of the United States at the time. It was the Vermont Republic, but they were the first. And then there would be more states that would follow suit, and slavery would become abolished in most of the North. So the slave labor fueled the market revolution. So the hard work from the enslaved uh, people in the South and the North uh, uh, made America, right? Um, in early 1800s, uh, states north of the Mason-Dixon line, and that is right there between Maryland and Pennsylvania, um, uh, they, they were abolishing slavery. And this was, this was gradual emancipation. So children's slaves would gain liberty when they're older. So they would kind of have to, they'd be like indentured servants. After 10, 15, 20 years, they would be set free. But their parents or grandparents would continue to live in slavery until, until they died. So it wasn't like the Emancipation Proclamation or the 13th Amendment during and after the Civil War where it just stopped. This would just gradually happen. So the North who often had a uh, sense of superiority, actually did continue in the North, right? Uh, they did protect slave owners' rights uh, instead of just uh, the slaves just being freed. But uh, some, it didn't happen much, but there was some slaves that were freed by their, their Northern owners. Now, the textile industry, and I also mentioned, like I said, not all, the states freed them at different times. I said Vermont was the first, Massachusetts was early as well. Uh, but places like New Jersey still had slavery all the way up until the Civil War. Uh, it, not, they were gradually emancipating slaves. So, for example, there would be older people who were still slaves, so not younger people. But New Jersey, ironically, we kind of have this picture that in the North, it was all abolished by the, the time of the Civil War. But there were still some older slaves like in places like New Jersey. Now, the textile industry, which was huge during the Industrial Revolution in Europe and in the United States and part of this market revolution, um, was the most prominent industries in the U.S. Hired lots of people, hired lots of women, right, in Lowell, Massachusetts. They used free labor. So they kind of had the, oh, we believe in free labor. Look at what the South is doing. But you have to consider, they depended on cotton and where was cotton f coming from? It was coming from the South. And who was picking the cotton? It were African slaves. So while I guess you can't say they were directly uh, continuing the institution of slavery, their industry depended on it. Um, yep, so in some free cities in the North, though, some free blacks, they could vote, they could own property, they could have a trial by jury. Spelt that wrong, so I gotta remind myself. Um, 
okay, so so trial by jury, and then they could they could start a business as well. And of course, in the in the South, the South is going to explode in the demand for African slaves. Uh, the founding fathers, many of them thought slavery would slowly go away after the Constitution. It just won't be needed, or people knew the how how terrible it was. And while that may be true, and maybe you could say that they were right about that in the North, they were wrong about that in the South. And why? Because Eli Whitney's cotton gin in 1793 had a patent for it. This... And also just the times with the market revolution, industrial revolution, the, the demand for textiles. Uh, this made picking cotton easier. Okay, well, let me explain that first. Well, first let me talk about, first of all, tobacco. Tobacco was the thing that saved the colonial America, British America, from, from starving. It made it a prosperous part of the British Empire, right? And tobacco was going to be important all the way up into the 1800s. It's still prominent today, right, in the South. But a lot of the fields in the South, they were they, they were unable to sustain tobacco growth. They couldn't they couldn't grow tobacco in these fields because they were destroyed from decades, centuries of growing tobacco. So they kind of had to move to the north and to the west, Virginia and northern upper South area, really. So those fields got replaced with cotton fields. And being that the cotton was necessary f for the market revolution, for textile, uh, they, they, there was a demand for African slavery. Um, but the problem was, was is that the cotton gin made it so easy to pick those little sticky seeds out of the cotton. And you would think, well, if you have this machine, so why do you need slaves? You don't need the slaves to, 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 to do this because you have a machine to make it easier. Well, okay, it's easier to pick the little seeds out. But you need the cotton picked from the fields. So you, they, there's, a, there's a higher demand for, for slavery. Uh, so basically the invention of the cotton gin, the demand for cotton, uh, increased the demand for slavery. So what we have here is you have the North criticizing slavery and going away from slavery and abolishing slavery. And you have more abolitionist movements, more free soil movements. But in the South, there's more and more of a demand, and people are dependent on it. So you have this, the country become more and more divided, and we know what's going to happen in the mid to late 16, 1800s. It's going to be a civil war. Uh, another interesting uh, development during the market revolution is the Lowell Mill towns. So Francis Cabot Lowell, and now he and some other people are kind of part of, considered like the fathers of the Industrial Revolution in the United States, are very important. He was in uh, Manchester, England for a couple years, and he he was witnessing how they they uh, organized their mills, textile mills, and different type of mills, uh, their factories, right? And he, he witnessed it, and he kept it all in his head, and he brought it back to the United States. He didn't write it down, or that'd be like smuggling or stealing state secrets from the British. Uh, but he had these new technological and organizational ideas. And he started these planned mill towns uh, called Lowell. You can go there today. There's a good university there in 1821. Uh, and this is the beginning of the American factory. And this is the first American manufacturing boom. And a lot of the workers in these mill towns were, were, were women. A lot, a lot of young women would go there. Uh, but this is kind of the, the development of the factory, right? Before, people would just kind of have a little shop, a little shoe shop, or a little clothes shop and make their goods there. And now you're kind of getting this new factory and production, new way of organizing and producing producing goods. So now we have the factory in the United States. Uh, but just the changes of industry altogether, you know, the market revolution changed many industries. Industries I just mentioned about the shoes, right? Small shops were taken over by mass production factories. So, for example, before, if you want a shoe, I go to a little shoe shop, let's say in colonial America or in the 17, late 1700s, and I go there and I, I say, okay, well, you know, I have my, this is my size and this is my width and this is what I want. Make me a shoe. Well, during the market revolution, people are like, well, you know what? We can mass produce a lot of shoes. They make a lot of different sizes. And then people can choose the size that fits them best, kind of like we do today. So this is kind of going to destroy those little, those little shops. 
Uh, and the apprentice master relationship changed to employer to employee. Now, this didn't happen overnight. This whole happened over decades, right? Uh, but it used to be, you know, you have an apprentice and you work there and they work you hard and then you learn the trade and then someday you take over and you become the apprentice. Well, while the that would still exist in some in some capacity, it's changing over time to more of the employer employee. So now I could leave if I don't like the job. That was an opportunity. Now it should be noted that for a lot of poor people, that just wasn't an opportunity. Even like today, right? Somebody who who might not have the skills or the opportunities other people have, they are kind of stuck at that job. Now they could quit and go somewhere else, but maybe it's not that easy. Maybe it's hard to find a job. So uh, some similarities there. But there's a growing gap between the rich and the poor. Now, some people think this is, well, listen, you work hard and you could be rich or you could be the owner of a business or a factory. And some people thought, well, the rich are taking, uh, taking, uh, taking, what did I write here? Taking over, taking advantage of, right? Okay, I don't have to change that. Ch uh, taking advantage of, of the um, of the poor, and we see the same discussion today, right? Some people who are very free market capitalists believe you work hard doesn't guarantee you'll have a success, and you can have a good life or a rich life or what you want. And other people say, well, the rich are getting too rich, and they're taking advantage of the workers. So, uh, my job is not to tell you what to think. My job is to make you think. What do you think? Write down your message below. But there's this, there's this idea of this northern kind of superiority superiority that, uh, you know, this free labor superiority. The, the north kind of had this arrogance of being superior to the south. And the south uh, didn't like that. And you have to remember the north depended on slavery as well, even though they abolished it for the most part. Uh but the South, you know, actually, you know, some late wage earners, they worked hard 12 hours, seven days a week in very dangerous situations. Children working. Uh, it was really a rough life for some people, and they would go back to nothing, right? They'd make very little money, have very poor lives in the North. And some people in the South would argue, well, the slaves have better lives than the wage earners in the North, right? Now, of course, the wage earners in the North could always leave. In the South, they had no choice, and that certainly wouldn't be true in all cases. Maybe there were some African slaves that were treated uh, properly, um, but they had no choice. You know, that's uh, that that's a terrible thing. And then, and then some slaves were treated awfully. So it depended. Uh, the conditions during the market revolution also changed uh, gender rules in the family life. So. Uh, so they changed a little bit. I mean, the same, there was still the same ideal of get married, have kids, and um, raise the kids while the father goes to work, the mother raises the kids and, and, and does work around the house. But the changing economics is going to also change the family, right? So before, marriage was more about necessity, right, and having kids, right? You get married because... It's part of society and often religion had something to do with it, but also it was a necessity. People had to take care of each other and they would have kids and the kids would be an economic asset. They would do work, right? Um, that would change. Uh, it, would be, it would turn slowly over more into love. Right? People would choose somebody because they loved them and they had fun with them. They liked their personality and whatnot. It wasn't just, okay, well, this relationship works best for us. Divorce was still rare, right? In some states, it was a little bit more common, but it was still very rare. Um, and and just like before, married couples were seen as one unit with a husband representing this unit. Uh, women, just like before, were traditionally expected to work at home and take care of the kids and, and do duties around the house. But some of these duties around the house were becoming less because of technological advance, advances. Advances, right? Um, but the poor women from poor families, they often had to go work, right? Some of them would go work in a factory or a tavern or an inn or somebody else's house. Um, they didn't have the privilege of staying home with the children. And the same thing, their children didn't have the privilege of going to school to a later age. They had to start working at a relatively young age. Uh, but the richer families, they could, they could follow that, that traditional wife stays at home 
trains and teaches the kid to be well behaved while the father earns the money. And often, before, often uh, kids would follow in the footsteps of their parents. Often they would work in the shop and they would learn the trade and then they would do the same thing when they're older. But this is starting to change in, their, in the early to mid to later 1800s where uh, they would, they would some, sometimes they feel still follow the, the, the father's trade or the mother's trade, which they do today in 20... 2020, you know, 2020. Um, but there's more people finding a different direction that might not follow the, their parents. Now, immigration. Now, immigration is going to be more and more immigrants coming in the early 1800s. Now, uh, it should be noted that after the American Revolution and uh, during the early Republic of the United States, there's lots of wars in Europe, lots of problems, you know, the French Revolution, the Napoleonic Wars. And not a lot of um, immigrants arrived, right? There was also problems. The United States was having problems with Europe, with the Quasi War, the Barbary, um, Barbary State Wars in Northern Africa. So there wasn't a lot of immigration at that time. But after the Napoleonic Wars, uh, more and more people from Europe would come. So there would be a, a big influx of, of immigration. You know, there's lots of opportunities, lots of land to the West. Come and see this land <laughs> and work the land and have a chance. You know, they might have problems back in their their home countries. Um, the Irish, lots of Irish. Now in the 1820s, 1830s, the Irish, they were not being, they're Catholic. They're not being treated properly by the, by the British. So some of them were leaving for that reason. But they also had the 1840s, 1850s, they have the Irish potato famine. So they're forced to move to different parts of the world. A lot of them would choose America. And the Irish, a lot of them would come by themselves, right, now as family units. units. And some of them would drink a lot, and some of them would be a little rowdy and fight and stuff like that. And they kind of really had a bad reputation. But they were also treated very poorly by many of Americans. They didn't want them in, in coming over, taking their jobs and... And there's also still kind of an anti-Catholic sentiment in the United States, right? I mean, the United States uh, had a lot of Protestant uh, families uh, right, right from the beginning. Catholics weren't treated fairly right from the beginning when they came in the early, um, uh, you know, I mean, at the very beginning in the 1600s. And the same thing here. So Irish were really discriminated against a lot. Uh, you had the Germans from the German states. It wasn't Germany like it is today. They were coming for, they, there were some failed revolutions, so they also kind of leaving instability for more stability. Uh, the Germans often went to the rural areas. So they would go into Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, kind of the old northwest area, while the Irish were going to the big cities. And you also had lots of Jews, and there was also anti Semitism around too, so it was not it was not easy for for um, some people would welcome immigrants and some people would not welcome them because there's more and more coming in, and of course these people are going to make America what America is today. So speaking of that anti-Catholic uh, or um, Irish sentiment, there is kind of an increase in nativism, right? The influx of immigrants triggered nativist sentiments. Uh, and some of this was for, for practical reasons, like they don't want to lose their jobs, right? But some of it was was a bit maybe racist or just a nativist ideology, this pro-Protestant um, ideology, not accepting of other, other ways of life. But, um, uh, yeah, I think I, I said most about this in the last, the, last, the last slide. But if you look at this picture, this is uh, a depiction of an Irishman. And it shows him kind of as a, as a kind of a drinker, a drinker, right? And just kind of racist in its in its, its appearance. Uh, and he's he has like a fire, and below it says gunpowder, and and then it says Uncle Sam. I can't, I don't know if you can see that Uncle Sam's, which means the United States, obviously. So it's kind of suggesting the Irish are ruining the United States at this time. But there's a new political party. It's called the American Party. And it's because of this, this nativist sentiment, right? And the nativist party uh, is kind of anti-immigration. Uh, and it's better known as a know-nothing party because when people asked about their activities, they were told to say they know nothing. Uh, so they became known as a know-nothing party. Now, um, 
this and many other political parties throughout American history are never going to really have a lot of traction at last or win elections. But this is another another political party that came came about. So that's it. That's the market revolution. This is when the United States really kind of goes from an agricultural society to a more free market capitalist society. It's when it became more powerful, more industrious, uh, when it um, built the canals like this one or built the roads or built the bridges around the country connecting the United States uh, to, to, to each other. So... Uh, if you have any questions or have any comments, if you if there's any, if there's anything I said wrong, I'd love to hear from you. Right, please write it down in the in the in the comment section below. And also, please do check out my store. You know, uh, I have a lot of great stuff there, a lot of free stuff as well. So I hope you enjoy it. So uh, next week I'll come back and I'll do the next portion of lessons in humanities. Bye bye.